Okay, this is the second part of the quick two-part explanation of the actual Four Noble Truths. The first part was the reading of the Pali. Remember that the, uh, the Four Noble Truths is an ancient Vedic doctor's metaphor. One, suffering. Two, malady or disease. Three, diagnosis. And four, the medicine or the cure. Before we get into the Four Noble Truths, let's talk about the six chronological points of the Four Noble Truths. Okay, there's six chronological points to understand in the Four Noble Truths. Number one precedes the Four Noble Truths. That would be the primordial ignorance at Avijja. However, that's a point for another video. Avijja does not mean ignorance. It's literally the attribute of the Absolute. is beginningless. And we're talking in the KF 5.113. By the way, all metaphysics are exactly the same on this point, specifically Platonism, Neoplatonism, and that of uh, Vedantic thought. Okay, and we're talking about the KF 5.113 followers. The beginning of Avijja can never be discerned, i.e. it is beginningless. In other words, it has no point. There is no first cause, like in creationism, first sin or original cause. Looking for first cause in monism is the greatest or grandest fool's errand. There's no first cause or original sin in monism, of which Buddhism is a part, okay? There's, uh, hence, the first where ignorance is not where it is generated, cannot be found, such that it be, should be discerned, disciples. Ignorance, or avidya, is a condition. It is, avidya is without end. It is beginningless. And we're taught in the K of 5.113, it has no locus. It is literally the attribute of the absolute. Okay, chronologically, second is the second noble truth. Okay, what followers is the Aryan truth in the genesis of suffering? It is that cravings, agitation begets rebirth, and bondage accompanied with lust leading asunder hither and thither. That is to say, their essential cravings, agitation, for becoming other than self, and for unbecoming or rebecoming. This would be the annihilationist position, or in the Pali, it would be vibhava, literally the desire for extinction. In other words, you're tired of the round of bhava no bhava, literally be again becoming, again and again. In other words, the continual, perpetual, endless round of birth and rebirth, or transmigration, actually. So, the second noble truth is chronologically second. The first, of course, would be avidya, that precedes everything prior to it. Chronologically third is the first noble truth, that being suffering. So, number one, we have avidya. Number two, we have the consubstantial root of suffering, that being the desires and so forth of the co coordinate person who desires after X, Y, Z, and either wants extinction or craves after something in this life or for the next life. The first noble truth, which is chronologically third, what follows is the Aryan truth of suffering. It is that birth is suffering, old age, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, gloom, misery, suffering. Being in conjoinment with that which is despised is suffering, to be apart from that which is beloved is dukha, is suffering. Not obtaining what you desire is suffering. In short, and this is the most important point, the uh, original Pali says the five khandas or aggregates which are taken hold of are suffering. Most no-soul translations say the five grasping aggregates, but the Pali specifically says, and I support this with thousands of citations at kathodos.com, is pankupada kandaya. Upada literally means to take up, to grasp, to hold up, to take something up. In other words, the chitta is taking something up. The notion of five khandas grasping after each other, in other words, from beginning to end is only the five khandas, is completely nonsense. The metaphysics of monism and Buddhism are all in complete agreement. They're, the five khandas are grasped after. They are not, quote-unquote, the grasping khandas. They are grasped after. The third noble truth, which is chronologically fourth, what follows is the Aryan truth of the subjugation of suffering. This would, of course, be the diagnosis and the Vedic metaphor, which Gautama adapted the four noble truths therefrom. Aryan truth is subjugation of suffering. It's a complete subjugation of lusts, cravings, resignation, return to the supernal, being emancipation from the desires. Or in some unit in 3.25, quote unquote, laying down the burden. Okay? Now, chronologically fifth is obviously, of course, what follows the Aryan truth of going under the subjugation of suffering returning to the light. It is the Aryatam Yikamaga, okay, which is vision of the Absolute. And of course, Sama, in loose terms, of course, does not mean right. It literally refers to the Absolute or a stasis, a metaphysical state of the Chitta being in Sama. So, loose English translation, however accurate. Vision of the Absolute, Determination of the Absolute, Logos of the Absolute, Actualization of the Absolute, Subsistence upon the Absolute, Analysis of the Absolute, Anamnesis, Sati of the Absolute, Sati 
samasati, okay? And number eight, synthesis or conjoinment with the absolute, samasamadhi, okay? The fourth noble truth is chronologically fifth. The sixth chronological point is just an extension of the fourth. That would be liberation, citta vimutta, liberation of the noose, the spirit of the citta, which is equal to the Buddhahood in scripture, as I mentioned in Majjhima Nikaya and Anguttara Nikaya 1.255. Those are the six noble truths in six chronological orders. The second noble truth comes first of the four noble truths chronologically. However, prior to all four noble truths is avidya, which is beginningless. Remember, there is no first cause or quote-unquote original sin in monism. Any variety of monism cannot have something a part of the absolute. It would be dualistic by its very nature and premise and definition. Avidya has no locus. Avidya is a privation. This is, of course, a point for not only another video, but basically another thousand videos discussing Avidya, something so simplex that is unbelievable and yet takes such great elaboration. It is almost laughable that you have to go into such detail about such a simple term. Some poly terms and some metaphysical things are so simplex and yet they require volume after volume after volume to explain them. However, with wisdom, it's understood just like that instantly. Very simplex to understand, very, very hard to actually elaborate on and get the point across as to what it is. So those are the original Four Noble Truths. Remember that there is no such thing as grasping aggregates in the suttas. It literally says, Panku Parnakandaya. Get the second Noble Truth regarding what is the malady. Okay, That's Kamatanna, Bhavatanna, Vibhavatanna. The desire is after lust, the desire for becoming or perpetual becoming, either a better life, a better future, or a better next life. Bhavatana. Vibhavatana. The desire to end it all, a type of spiritual suicidism or oblivionism, is a nihilism or natika. Vibhava literally means complete extinction, perpetually, metaphysically, and existentially. Third Noble Truth, of course, again, talking about the diagnosis. The Fourth Noble Truth, talking about the Ariyat and Maga. This is a point for another video, but there are not only one Eightfold Path, there are two Eightfold Paths in Sutta in all Pali translations. And surprise, surprise, there is the Ariyadasa Maga, the Aryan Tenfold Path. So there are actually three paths in Buddhist scripture. This is not my position, this is not my view or speculation, this is doctrinal fact. All translations on this are identical. However, almost no Buddhist knows about it. There are two Ariyatangika Magas, two Eightfold Paths in Sutta, mentioned in Majjhima Nikaya, Book 2. I'll give you the verse later in another video. And there is the Ariyadasa Maga, the Aryan Tenfold Path, which is even above those. Making things complex? No, it's actually very simplex. Anyway, I hope that was a quick condensation for you, what the Four Noble Truths are and why they are not original to Buddhism and how Gautama adapted them from an ancient Vedic doctor's metaphor. Use them for his own metaphysical ends. Didn't hijack them, but simply adapted them to use it as a metaphysical metaphor, symbolism, so that his disciples could come to quick realization of what the source of their suffering is and how to quickly eliminate it. Remembering once again that in Gautama's time, People became arahants, many of them did, obviously not all, but a great number became arahants, completely liberated, suvimutta, within a matter of two weeks. Thank you, and stay tuned for the next video.